Portland City Council approves unfunded plan, unfunded plan to criminalize unsheltered homelessness. Ooh, that's a lot of words that mm, don't paint a very pretty picture, do they? We're getting into it. We're talking about it. City of Portland, their council is looking around going, holy crap, there's a lot of homelessness here. We are overrun with it. We can't get our downtown core back. What are we going to do? Well, let's talk about it some, and then we'll come up with a game plan and then, yeah, all right, that's what we're getting into today. What is their game plan? Yeah, all right. Stay tuned. We're going to talk about it. Here we go. The Portland City Council voted Thursday to approve a plan to ban unsheltered homelessness and create mass outdoor homeless encampments across the city. This has been proposed. It's been proposed, I think, for a couple of weeks now. We've talked about it. Now, they voted it in. Now, what does that mean? Well, this is what they're proposing. It's passed the city council. All right. City council knows they've got to do something. If anybody in that city council wants to remain elected, you got to do something. Because Portland has probably got some of the worst homelessness across the United States for a city of its size. The package of five resolutions introduced by Mayor Ted Wheeler and City Commissioner Dan Ryan two weeks ago, it outlines a number of aspirational and unfunded plans to address homelessness and housing needs. See, we keep coming up with aspirational. All right, we have aspirations of doing this. However, uh, yeah, it, we don't have don't have any funding and don't really know where we're going to do it. Don't have the basics, but you know, we're going to go with it anyway. The initial proposal aimed to create up to three designated camping sites with space to hold up to 500 people in unidentified locations. So these camps, they wouldn't be created before the city secures funding for the camps, which it currently does not have. The proposal states that these sites would open to the public within 18 months after those funds are secured. So you can see where we're going with this, right? You can kind of see what we've got going on. Not much. All right, but we do have a plan. We've got a plan. Don't have any funding. Don't really know where it's going to go. Don't really know what it looks like. Don't really, mm, yeah. Under the proposal, once those camps are open, the city would start enforcing a ban on camping in public spaces. If people decline to vacate public property, they would be subject to criminal penalties. However, the proposal requests funding and support from the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office to create a diversion court to keep those charged out of jail. All right, so there's no real repercussions to camping in these areas where it's illegal. We don't have funding for the 500 spots that are going to be available. Don't know where they're going to be. In, um, in the private sector, this is known as mm, not much of a plan at all. It's a plan. It's a plan. But that's about it, right? That's about it. Because this, this doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, it's, it's kind of what government has to do, but – it, what it does is it focuses on it it focuses on the massive inadequacies inadequacies that we've got going on right now which are you've got thousands of people living outside in Portland you've got rampant open drug use you got people dying of overdoses on the regular you've got crime has skyrocketed. You've got break-ins of businesses because they've got to be able to steal from somewhere to support their drug habits. And you've got a city council that has basically condoned all this by either decriminalizing everything or just basically saying, yeah, we've got laws on the books, but we're not really going to do much about them. And you've got too few police to police, you know, a, a good sized cities that has all this stuff going on. So, you know, how, how do you think that's going to work out? Mm, not well. And that's what we're seeing. This is literally what we've got going. The proposal, the proposal also makes a goal of building 20,000 units of affordable housing by 2033. 20,000 units 
in 11 years. 20,000 units. Now, big cities have a hard time putting together a couple hundred units, 500 units. That's, that's a big task, a huge task. And you are talking about building 20,000. I mean, high aspirations. That is something that you could look to in a report and say, yeah, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. This is, these are our aspirations, but that's never going to happen. Just flat, never going to happen. Not going to happen. And that's, um, and so you got this 20,000 units of housing by 2033 through new policies and funding requests and proposed partnering with a nonprofit called Work Systems Incorporated to help create more jobs for unhoused Portlanders. Lastly, the plan compels the city to ask the state legislature, Multnomah County Metro, and other jurisdictions to help fund the proposal. No government organizations have yet agreed to do this. So Portland City Council just kind of came up with this plan and said, yep, this is good. But it has zero backbone and it has zero ability to probably move forward. I mean, who's going to back this up? I mean, this, this thing is so far away from reality. That I, I mean, it, it's, it's almost not even worth doing this podcast, but we're going to do it anyway. Because, you know, this is what we've got going on. And this really puts a spotlight on why this situation is as bad as it is already. And then moving forward, what can people in the city of Portland expect will be, you know, immediate results. And based on this proposal, the immediate results are nothing. Because how long is it going to take to put, you know, get funding for this stuff? How long is it going to take to get a location, get a site, get three sites, get three sites set up? That could take years, years. And then from then, once they've got funding, another 18 months, you could be, you could be three, four years down the road before any of this even starts to stick a little bit. How many people in Portland, how many more people are going to become homeless in Portland by that time? How many people in Portland are going to die from drug overdoses in that time period? Mm, quite a bit. I had somebody make the comment the other day, is, ah, it, it appears that the, uh, you know, the, the, the homeless problem is kind of working its way out with the rapid increase in overdoses. And it's like, oh, that's terrible. And then you think about it, it's like, mm, yeah, that is kind of cleaning up the problem, but not in the way that you want, because those people are somebody's kids. At one time, they were somebody's kids. So people want to have hope for these folks. And yet the way that, you know, a city like Portland and to a certain extent, city like Seattle, LA for sure, I mean, you've got these situations where San Francisco, you, know, you go down the normal normal line of, um, you know, cities guilty of just saying, hey, live wherever you want. What could possibly go wrong? It's all going to be good. You go down this list of cities and, you know, you've just got this, you've just got this obvious, obvious set of structures that have created this situation. And this kind of thing doesn't address them at all. It doesn't address them at all. All it does is kick the can down the road. Guess what? City of Portland can't wait. They can't wait. Now, City of Seattle, they are clearing out homeless encampments like there's no tomorrow. So there's kind of this thing where, all right, maybe Seattle isn't the greatest spot in the world for us to be homeless in. Maybe maybe we scooch on down to Portland because guess what? It's going to be years before they put anything on the books that makes sense. Years based on this. Now, what I think should happen and it's never going to happen because you don't have the funding for it and you don't have the ability for the city to put it together. You don't have the politicians with backbone to enact it. You got to take those that are on drugs. If you're on the streets, you put them in treatment. Okay. You got people with homeless issues, with mental issues that are homeless. You got to get them in some kind of facility. You got to get them off the streets because they shouldn't be out there. So those are your two main groups. The other one is you got to start arresting people that have outstanding warrants because so 
many times you read these stories and you're like, all right, this guy got, he got tossed in jail, not for being homeless, but because he had an outstanding warrant for his arrest or he didn't show up in court 30 last 32 times he was charged. So between those three things, those three things, I think you're going to cut down homelessness incredibly. But again, like I said, hey, that would be the logical approach. And I think that's what most reasonable people believe. But it's just we're in a situation where we don't have the ability to get the funding for the mental health care. We don't have the ability, nor do we have the desire to involuntarily put people in a mental institution or in inpatient treatment get where they can get detox. We don't, we don't, we don't do that. We just believe that everybody, you know, is going to make up their mind when they do that may or may not be before they overdose from, you know, a lethal dose of fentanyl, which is taking people out left and right. Aaron Carter, good example. I mean, Nick Carter's what younger brother, I believe. Yeah, younger brother. I was reading his story. If you don't know who he is, he is a musician and he hit it really big. I think he sold a million albums when he was 10. And, um, you know, phenomenal career early on, but then kind of went down some of these roads that a lot of the, the pop stars, the rock stars go, go to because they just got way too much money. And unfortunately, he, you know, didn't make it past his, you know, he's 34. He's dead. Super sad. Somebody super talented just go down. But how often do we see that? Yeah. And so these folks that are have no resources that are on the streets, it's happening to them at a much greater rate, I believe. We don't even really have stats on on that. Um because I think it's it's hard to keep track of the homeless population. And so the stats on that kind of stuff is always it's a little bit wiki whack, right? The city budget offices estimate the camps would cost up to six point eight million annually to operate with the new housing costing nearly $10 billion to build. Let me, let me just read that last part. Nearly $10 billion to build. Huh. That seems like a lot. So where is Portland going to go? I'm, you know, for financing on that. I'm a real estate guy. My appraisals have, have supported literally billions and billions of dollars of real estate being developed here in Seattle and the East side and, you know, all over Western Washington. There's nobody that it's going to lend Ah, 10 billion. Yeah, you bet. I mean, even government bonds, anything you can think of 10 billion to build. Mm. We're in a period right now because of declining tax revenue. City of Seattle has got a massive budget shortfall that they're trying to work through. So can you imagine them pitching to, to entities and to the city? Hey, uh, yeah, we're, we're a little shy right now. We're 140 million shy, I think, is what the Seattle city budget is. And um, but could you lend us ten, ten large? No, not trillion. We just need billion, uh, not trillion, ten billion. I mean, come on, you know, show some love. Ten, ten B. The proposal passed Thursday to include several tweaks due to amendments introduced by other commissioners. Specifically, council approved an amendment introduced by City Commissioner Carmen Rubio to expand the number of camping sites to six that are limited to a maximum of 250 people each. Oh, you want to have one of these bad boys in your backyard? I don't think so. So, yeah, I mean, we don't even have this squared away yet, right? Council also greenlit an amendment by City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty that mandated the proposed camps be diversely spread across the city. All right. So everybody gets one. I want to see those put in the wealthiest communities in Portland. See how that goes over. See how, you know, see, see how quick it takes for lawsuits to just start shooting, right? Because that's what would happen. Commissioners rejected an amendment posed by Hardesty. This is what I want to talk about earlier. Uh, rejected an amendment posed by Hardesty that requested the city's attorney office to research whether the city could use eminent domain, a tool that the government can use to take private property, convert it to public use, to house Portlanders in vacant buildings. This shows you how far out of the loop of reality a person on city council like Joanne Hardesty is. 
She literally doesn't know what she's talking about. Somebody probably told her, oh, hey, you know, there's this thing called eminent domain where the government can just take, you know, individual's private property and put it for the use of, you know, the city and it's all good. You know, they just pay him a little bit of money for the property and we all move on. That has to be for like a freeway or a roadway or some type of easement for city utilities or something pretty major. You just can't, just because a building is vacant doesn't mean that it's not in the permitting process, doesn't mean that they're looking to do something with it down the road. And if you own property, you may have that thing sit for years. You might as it goes through the permitting process. You might do that. And that's kind of your call. That's called owning real estate. The city shouldn't be able to just, ah, it's been vacant for a while. Therefore, we're just going to take it over. Here we come, eminent domain. I mean, that's just a, a terrible, terrible idea. And one that would never happen. If, it hap if that happened in Portland, that would be because Portland is under communist rule. And... <laughs> You know, some of you would say that's not far off. It, it's already there. So why don't you just let her rip and see what happens? Now, she got shut down pretty hard for the eminent domain. I, she just doesn't understand what that really entails or what that really means. I don't think she owns a home. I'd be very surprised if she owned a home. And uh, from that standpoint, she just doesn't get it. Hey, you work hard to get your real estate. If you want to let it sit vacant, you know, that's your call. If you're still paying your taxes, and if you're not, then you know, tax bill is going to build up. And after a while, your property gets sold to cover the taxes. That's how it works. If you don't pay your mortgage payment, yeah, a lender comes after you. But the city, city can't come after you. And oh, no, we're just going to take it. Because then what would the city do with said property they want to take for eminent domain? Now, they're probably going to have to knock the build, whatever building down, right? And start over from scratch. That's not really the business the city's in. The city buys buildings and converts them, right? Or buys buildings that are already set up. City of Redmond and Bellevue here have purchased old hotels, for example, and then they do a quick retro and get them up and running and yeah, fill them up with people that are on drugs. So the main resolutions were not passed unanimously. All five backed the resolutions to increase workforce options for unhoused Portlanders and increase the housing supply, create a criminal diversion program and find funding for the programs. Funding for this. How are you going to fund it? Are you going to float up some more taxes? What are you going to do there? Yeah, it's unknown. But hey, we got a plan. Got that plan. Plans on the books. Hardesty, who is headed into an election next week, this was written last week, against a candidate who supports a camping ban, was the sole commissioner who voted against the resolution that would criminalize unsheltered camping and create mass camps, calling it cruel and inhumane. No, I, I don't think that's the case because what is going on is people are given the option, hey, you can move into this housing. And if at that point you don't want to, unfortunately, there has to be consequences for your actions. From that standpoint, I am all for this. And I say, City of Portland, move forward. But it's just such a high and mighty. It's got such lofty aspirations. 20,000 units, billions and billions to build. I mean, and then there's no guarantee that that's actually going to stop homelessness, is there? No. You got to get to that root cause. What is causing people to be homeless like this? And if you can get kind of a handle on that, and there you go, right? Some cities just don't tolerate it, right? They just don't tolerate it. You might be sitting in one. And that's maybe why you're, you know, tuning into this podcast, because you're not dealing with that nonsense because you choose not to. Hey, I'm not going to pay taxes to a city that just lets people live wherever willy nilly they want to. Not doing that. That's your call. And that's what the city of Portland is, is, you know, bearing down on right now is, oh my gosh, we've got this enormous issue. Oh, yeah, we don't have any way to pay for it moving forward with our plan. But you know, we know that we need to we, we we need to build a lot more you know units of housing. And I don't. The more units of housing you build, the more people become homeless. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. City-run shelters, okay? Yep, those are not pleasant. Get it? I get that. But that's it's not. They're not meant to be pleasant. They are meant to be a bare bones roof over people's heads 
while they get up and running, however they're going to get up and running and do their thing. Unfortunately, the way we've got it right now, Portland's got it right now, is that people can live just wherever they want and without really any restrictions and without any, you know, anything that it pushes back on that lifestyle. I know many become frustrated with me that I spend so much time discussing the safety and needs of the houseless and low income community members at Hardesty. Some take it to mean I don't care about the safety and well being of homeowners and businesses. But that's simply not true. I hear and share the anxiety and frustration community members feel around the city about the houseless crisis. How about if you had a business and a house, and both of those got rocked by the homeless? Homeless are just pooping on your lawn out in front. Yeah, I think it would be it would this would be a different conversation if every single one of these council members had a business and you know, it's getting stolen from on the regular, on the regular. Cuz people on drugs, you know, they got to create that extra income somehow and they're not doing it by going to work at McDonald's. No, they're stealing. They're breaking into businesses, they're breaking into homes. They're doing whatever it takes to make that happen. Hardesty goes on to say, and I'm committed to continuing to work to solve the problem, but the solution as outlined here isn't real. All right. Okay. On that part, I agree with her. The solution outlined here isn't real. This is not a real solution. Will we get a fraction of this? Maybe. You know, trying to spin this, I'm a real estate guy. Trying to spin this program that's that's going to be a tough sell. This has so many obstacles in front of it. That it, to me, it's like, okay, r- really? How are we going to do this? How is this going to go down? The package of resolutions has been fast-tracked through City Hall with few details and brief community input. Last week, City Commissioners heard seven hours of public testimony on the proposal. Yet instead of an organic mix of public opinions, the first hour or so of public testimony came strictly from those in favor of of the proposed ban. Interesting. People in Portland, they they want to see this ban happen and they're a proponent of it. Hmm. Wild, right? I don't I don't get it. I mean, I think Portland's got a pretty good look right now. No, said nobody. That was an intentional decision made by Ryan to allow business lobbyists and realtors to be heard first. Well, that's interesting. Huh? People actually have to sell the homes uh, that are located near the homeless encampments. Been talking about that lady lately. You could, uh, there's a, a, a quick little podcast I've got out on that. And business lobbyists, hmm, the people that are getting rocked on the daily, their livelihoods are being impacted by homelessness. Huh, that's interesting. It left those in opposition of the ban, including many unhoused people, feeling intentionally unheard by elected officials. No, 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 no. You're heard and you are seen and you are smelt on the streets on the daily. We get it. We get it. You're living there. Yep. On Thursday, council heard from additional members of the public to comment on several amendments made by commissioners. So this is basically the guts of it. And the article goes on to talk about, um, you know, varying different angles from people in the community that are, ah, I'm pro this, I'm pro that. But the vast majority of it is, is people want a solution now to their homelessness issue. And guess what? You're not going to get one. Unfortunately, that is the reality. That's the, that's the hardcore reality. If you have let the cat out of the bag so hard that your city looks like Portland, mm, cleaning that up, that's going to be tricky. That's going to be tricky. Now, you can do all the sweeps you want, but you're just you know moving people around. And I think Seattle has done a pretty good job of that from the standpoint of, you know, the areas that need to be cleaned up have been cleaned up. Now, unfortunately... And that's in like the downtown core and where, where the tourists are. But unfortunately, then that pushes people out further out into the suburbs. And that's what you're hearing a lot about from Portland as well, is that it's spread into the suburbs already, and it's impacting things there too. Here's, here's one more paragraph I'm going to read. I think the biggest reason for this is the economic drive for development in Portland, said Jacobson. I don't believe the energy behind this issue is in good faith. 
Well, good faith is out the window because you got people on drugs doing all kinds of crazy stuff, living willy-nilly wherever. So that's not good faith either. I think a lot of it is being pushed by large financial interests. Okay. All right. All right. The business owners and the real estate guys. Okay. All right. Let's talk about that for a split second. How about tax base? How about, how about those two words? Your tax base. Without businesses, without continued development of businesses in, a, in an area, I mean, what is the city of Portland's city budget going to look like in another year or two, given the trajectory of businesses leaving? I mean, it's been pretty, it's been pretty astounding to see how many companies have just basically locked up their doors. We're not doing business in Portland. Yeah, our other locations and other areas, we're going to keep them going because they're making money and they're not getting rocked on the regular. But the ones in downtown Portland, and, and a lot of this is specifically downtown Portland. So you've got entities that are behind what provides a large portion of the tax structure for a city like Portland. You're going to let those folks go first. Yeah, you are. You are. Because you know, they get priority. That's just how this works. And you might say, oh, that's not fair. Well, neither is letting people live in tents on city property willy nilly, wherever, in a park, by the rivers, you know, you've got crazy stuff going on. People living, you know, in um, nature preserves and green belts, all kinds of stuff. I and mean, you've got 150 cars were just found at the you know, stolen ca chassis of cars were just found at the last big homeless encampment sweep in, in Portland. 150. Imagine what 150 cars looks like just in a field, let alone in like a green belt area. Huh? What is the ecological impact of that? What's the what's the climate impact of that? That's what I want to know. That's what I would want to know. All right. So bottom line is, we've got a plan. We've got no budget. We've got no real direction. We've got no sight where this is going to happen. But we got a plan. I'll keep reporting back on how this plan is moving along. You might want to check in, you know, every now and then on this one, because I don't think you're going to see a lot of action. You're going to see a stripped down version of this. You're going to see a stripped down version of this, something that they can actually enact and get going, but not this big grandiose deal, because th this is just, yeah, not happening. Wish it was, wish it was. Certain to a certain point, but to have, you know, uh, I just want to see homelessness get squared away. I want to see people getting into treatment. However, you can do that. All right, let's go. It's go time. All right, that's it for me on this one. Thanks so much for being here. I'll catch up with you in the next one. Bye for now. <laughs>